the the data actually residually lives on in the manuscripts. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter, honestly, whether Martian's Gospel is earlier or later. It's embedded in it's every there. single manuscript of canonical Luke. Oh. Every single manuscript of canonical Luke is a manuscript of Martian's Gospel. Even in our Bibles today, what you're reading, yeah. it, at least in, in some degree, whether it's you say it's 40 percent, 50 percent or whatever, that data is Marcionite data to some extent of saying the Evangelion is the earliest gospel that we know of, and maybe even Marcion, for, by Vincent's view, this is the very first gospel. This is like, Marcion is really pioneering the genre. Uh, Klinghart would say this text goes back to the 80s, first century, so it's one of our earliest extant gospels. And just for context too, if, if you look through like Eusebius and all of his references to early apologetics and, and early treatises, you'll find that a lot, there's a, you know over a dozen polemics or treatises or works either to or against Marcion in the late second century, that the very first commentary we have on any gospel at all, any gospel is on Marcion's gospel. So Origen writes commentaries on canonical Luke, canonical Matthew, canonical John, but before Origen wrote any of those commentaries, Tertullian wrote a commentary on Marcion's gospel. Wow. And he didn't write a commentary on any other gospel. Today, my guest is Dr. Mark Bilby, who holds a PhD from the University of Virginia, graduating in 2012 from its program in Judaism and Christianity in Antiquity, which combined the study of early Christianity, New Testament, Greco-Roman classics, rabbinics, and Tanakh studies. Mark has also earned a master's in library and information science from Drexel University in 2015 and previously completed two master's degrees in theology from the Nazarene Theological Seminary. Today we're discussing Marcion of Sinop, who scholars agree was one of the first people, if not the first, to put together a Christian canon in which some of the letters of Paul combined with what looks like a form of Luke. Mark is going to demonstrate today how he thinks, and some other scholars agree, Marcion's version of Luke predates the version of Luke that you have in your Bible right now. Stay tuned for this one. You're not going to want to miss this. Mark Bilby, welcome to the show. And this topic for Marcion is something that my audience loves because I've talked about Marcion and the evil creator. I had Lewa on. We discussed his, his different, how people view Marcion, how central he was to this time period. So today we're going to switch it up and talk about his gospel and Luke. And so a lot of scholars think that it's the same gospel with a little bit of slightly differences. And you're saying that Marcion's is actually before Luke. That is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not alone in this. This has been a position that uh, scholars have held going back more than 200 years. Uh, there's a scholar named Semler who the late 18th century came up with the the basics of this idea this was the dominant idea in german higher education in the mid 19th century so famous scholar ferdinand christian bauer albert Ruschel, and and several others uh, so if you were in german higher education in the 1850s this would have been the standard view but then wow. there was a, a backlash after darwin after vatican I. There was a big backlash against this view, and that's where you get the views of Hahn and Zahn and Lightfoot and several others who who kind of re-entrenched the traditional view. You see Lightfoot's Luke. name everywhere. You yes. cannot you cannot be a scholar or someone who di- who digs deep into the sources yep. without seeing that name everywhere. Citation, citation, citation. Lightfoot, 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 yep. Lightfoot. So and Will, William Sandy as well. William Sandy. That's another so name. You a, see a lot of the, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the prestigious British academics, but also together with German academics at the turn of the 20th century, they re-entrenched the traditional kind of proto-orthodox hypothesis. But the the idea that Marcion's Gospel was the earlier, simpler form that continued on as kind of a minority position. So there was a scholar named John Knox. He's not to be confused with the Scottish theologian John Knox, but he taught at the University of Chicago, and and you can actually trace a little bit of a genealogy there where uh, Joseph Tyson was a student of John Knox's at Chicago, and then Tyson wrote a book defending this thesis uh, back in 2006. 
and then uh and then but it's really picked up steam again just in the last about 15 years so matthias klinghart devoted 10 plus years of his life to researching this and and writing you know massive books in german uh getting through all the manuscript going through all the manuscript uh variants and so on jason badoon did a similar thing though his reconstruction was in english there's a prominent classicist in italy named andrea nicolodi He's done his own critical edition of Marcion's Gospel. Dieter Roth did his own critical edition. So there's just been a massive amount of scholarship mm -hmm. looking carefully at this text. And most of the scholars who look carefully at it, they come to the conclusion that it's actually the earlier text. Wow. So this is this is Nicolodi, this is Klinghart, this is Badoon, this is Grimaglia, another Italian scholar, uh, and, and, and several others. Roth is really kind of the odd person out in terms of uh, reinforcing the traditional view, even while looking at Marcion's gospel. And I would say that that prejudice actually undermines his reconstruction in, in some pretty si significant ways. All right, before we start and get into this, I want to ask you, so is it safe to say, like, let's say, let's say that you're correct. That would mean that what we're looking at today is one of the original, original four gospels one of the one of the main gospels one of the earliest uh existing gospels and you know this is a, a bone of contention usually opponents of marcion's gospel would say this doesn't exist anymore you know because you know we know it existed but you know all the manuscripts have been destroyed except there's some debate around papyrus 69 whether it is an authentic uh marcionite um papyrus claire clebot lazan has argued that badoon has followed that point of view um, but whether it exists or not in as a distinct text in Papyrus 69, in some ways, to me, this is immaterial because, you know, pretty much all scholars, 99% of, of us who look at this would say this is a version of Luke. The, the only question is, is Marcin's gospel an earlier form of Luke or is it a later abridgment of Luke, right? Those are the two main positions. So the way I look at it is, you know, either Marcin's gospel is like a second draft where Luke was the first draft or Marcin's gospel is a first draft where Luke was the second draft. But in any case, right, you know this working on any book or any any kind of substantive work, uh, if you're m working in multiple versions, there's going to be a lot of overlap between right. the versions. There's a, If you just look at the granular level of, of words, of like looking at each word as a bit of data, yeah, then there's a huge amount of data overlap between these texts. And in that case, the, the data actually residually lives on in the manuscripts. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter, honestly, whether Marcin's gospel is earlier or later. It's embedded in it's every there. single manuscript of canonical Luke. So every single manuscript of canonical Luke is a manuscript of Marcin's gospel, not I in guess. its overall form, but in terms of the data it contains. Right. That it, these are all Marcionite gospels that yeah. we have in our, even in our Bibles today. What you're reading yeah at least in, in some degree, whether it's, you say it's 40% or and 60% or whatever, that data is Marcionite data to some extent. Yeah, and these are Greek Middle Platonists. I don't want to say anti-Jewish people, but they're, they're opponents of the traditional Jewish thinking. They have a opposing thing. They have some things that are not in common with these guys. And so... Um, well, do you want to comment on that before? Well, I yeah, yeah. Let me step back a little bit. You mentioned it's one of the, potentially one of the earliest gospels. I would just echo that. Um, but there's a diversity of views on that. So, you know, Klinghart, for instance, and, and Vincent, I think, is in the same place of saying the Evangelion is the earliest gospel that we know of. And maybe wow. even Marcion, for, by Vincent's view, this is the very first gospel. This is like Marcion is really pioneering the genre. Uh, for people like Badoon and, and Klinghart and myself, um, well, there's a, there's a diversity of views here, but but Badun and I would both see Marcion as more of a passive, uh, you know, um, conduit uh, rather than like a, s a significant heavy-handed editor. And so, you know, we see him as inheriting an earlier text. Uh, Klinghart would say this text goes back to the 80s, first century, so it's one of our earliest extant gospels. And just for context too, if, if you look through like Eusebius and all of his references to early apologetics and and early treatises, you'll find that. A lot. There's, you know, over a dozen polemics or treatises or works, either to or against Marcion in the late second century. So, wow. like, uh, most of these are gone. We don't have them anymore. Um, yeah. But it's also, to me, it's 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 super important and informative that the very first commentary we have on any gospel at all, 
any gospel is on Marcion's gospel. So Tertullian, right? Origen writes commentaries on canonical Luke, canonical Matthew, canonical John. But before Origen wrote any of those commentaries, Tertullian wrote a commentary on Marcion's gospel. Wow. And he didn't write a commentary in any other gospel. And let me let me throw this by. This is so this is my thoughts right now. This is what I think. I think there was probably some sort of Q document floating around. Then I think Mark is the first gospel. Then I think Mark and Q are now floating around together in in different circles. Yeah. Marcion has both. Marcion constructs a gospel using both Q and Mark, and this is how you get what we call Luke. But it's Marcion first. That's that's pretty close to the hypothesis that I've been arguing now for about three years in an open science book. The first hypothesis is that Marcion's gospel is a two-source gospel. Now, whether or not he's the author or editor of, of the gospel, to me, it's kind of moot. Uh, you know, we can get into, you know, specifics on that. But to me, I see a very clear two-source program where, uh, you know, the Q stuff, all the sayings of Jesus, they're very yeah. densely present in Marcion's gospel. But it also has significant uh, sequential overlaps with Mark yeah, in, and it's in, two, in two places. But um, But I would say it's not. The Mark as we know it, it's an early version of Mark, but the Mark gets later, much later expanded. Sure. It almost like tripled in size, likely uh, in the mid second century. So yeah, we, we shouldn't assume yeah. I'm not Mark and priority is, is actually a, a deeply problematic view because it looks at this text as, as a, you know, a one-off production when actually, if you just, if you compare right. it like word for word or verse by verse, you'll see Mark is often significantly expanding these traditions, but not only that, it's actually synthesizing. Yeah, and Luke that's and, what, Luke and Matthew, right? You can find and, a Luke and tradition, and a Matthew tradition, say. and it gets smushed together. Say, looking at Matthew makes you th realize that there had to be some sort of form before Mark, because Mark, it's not like Matthew's copying Luke. Matthew's still looking at Mark, but it also has the stuff with that shares with Luke. So it makes you wonder. There's got to be some other source there that they're all sort of getting from, which would be Q. Yeah, that makes sense that I, that's, yeah, I think yeah. I said it right. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people throw out Occam's razor as if that is, you know, we, we, we shouldn't, you know, hypothesize sources or we shouldn't hypothesize multiple versions. But uh, to me, that's lazy academics because, uh, you know, the, the trajectory or the tendency in all these documents is that they're constantly being rewritten. Right. And like, the, that's and what we see in texts across that, the board. That, that, multi, yeah, if a that, text stays popular, if that, it catches that, on, that, it's always getting rewritten. That's yeah, the that, norm. Occam's razor doesn't, doesn't work for this because you have to explain why is that Luke and Matthew have this source material in common that Mark doesn't have. Yeah. You know? And so there, the, I mean, it's possible that it's possible that there's, I guess it's, anything's possible is what I'm saying. Anything's yeah. possible, but the likelihood is that they're probably the way that we know how texts are copied. People don't just add their own favorite People don't just add their own stories to the yeah. thing. They're copying yeah. something. Right. That's how it usually is. They're not, it's not, not like Matthew came along and says, I'm going to add my favorite little story to this. Yeah. No, he, yeah. he had it. He was, he was a copyist. Right. You know, and, so. and we, we can, we can look at common trends in document production and antiquity. That's helpful. How things are constantly being rewritten. You know, we can look at pseudonymous, you know, like Bart Ehrman's work. He, he frequently looks at how people are impersonating other authors or writing works in the names of other authors. That's common or expanding on things. Um, but we can also just look at linguistic data patterns. So that that's really what I'm trying to do for the first time with the Evangelion. Marcus Vincent's working in a very similar direction, but on, focus on Marcion's ap Apostolos, his collection of Paul's letters. But wh what I think I've shown is that there are significant, statistically significant, like non-random non variations between uh, the Q sections in Marcion's gospel and then the Mark sections. So it, it, it kind of gets granular here, but you know, for instance, if you just take the two Greek letters, E-N, right? Epsilon nu, uh, it shows up and you take Badoon's um, version as a, as a sample. Uh, in the Q sections of Marcion's gospel, that, that little two letter combination, which is often a prefix, it's like the in yeah, as um, a prefix yeah. to a Greek word, uh, it shows up more than a hundred times in the Q section, but it shows up less than 10 times in the Mark sections. So there's a very different vocabulary going on, but then you can also look stylistically, right? There's like, you get constant, you know, the, the, the beatitudes, the woes, the give up your possessions, right? Like a lot of what in Jewish tradition would be called halakha, right? You, you have the, the ethical teachings uh, that are distilled in a succession of sayings, but mm -hmm. also fables, 
Um, but then if you look in the sections that overlap with Mark, they're all controversy or like most of them are controversy stories. Jesus does something to tick off the authorities and it turns into an argument. Jesus heals on the Sabbath and it turns into an argument. So the Mark and overlaps are, are filled with controversies over miracles and ritual piety. Yes. But the Q sections are full of teaching after teaching after teaching. And then the themes are different too. Like in the Q sections, there are women characters all over the place, women patrons of Jesus, women anointing Jesus. None of that in the Markin sections. Right. Right. All male characters in the Markin sections. Right. The, wow. the, Q, the Q sections are all about poor people. Like give to the poor, blessed are the poor, give up your possessions to give to the poor. Dives and Lazarus even, right, of stories about the poor, the rich fool, all the teachings about wealth and poverty pretty much all of them that they're all in Marcin's gospel, but they're all in those Q sections. The Markin passages don't give a care about the poor. There's, wow. there's, there's nothing at all about the poor in those sections that overlap with the Markin tradition. So to me, it's, it's super clear that Marcin's gospel is a two source gospel, but again, like it's only about a third of the size of canonical Luke. So wow. if it's really earlier than Luke, this is how we get back to Q. Right. Marcin's gospel is the direct path back to Q and then establishing wow. what its two sources are. But what I've shown is that Q in we, we tend to think Q is just a bunch of sayings. But if you look at Marcin's gospel, uh, the, this this continuity from beginning to end, like uh, references to Aesop or concern with the poor or whatever, or female patrons, that's beginning to end. So what I would say is Q is not just a sayings gospel. It's a full passion and resurrection gospel. Sure. I believe yeah, that so, too. Yeah. So, and and that's why Mark didn't, you know, early Mark is not inventing the 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 gospel genre with a yeah. passion and resurrection account. Mark, the early Mark is expanding it a little bit with some more references to Hebrew prophets and so on, with the, the suffering servant of Isaiah. It and makes that, sense. That sort of thing. It makes sense but, because Mark is very advanced. A, Mark, is yeah, come, it didn't just come out of the, the of a black hole like that. Right. It, it looks like it's it's provides in some ways. Right. Yeah. We, you know, we tend to think the empty tomb is such a simplistic tradition that that must have been the earliest form. Uh, and in Marcion's gospel, it has a similarly early form. There is an encounter on the road, um, but there are women patrons, right? No, no, you know, no reference to the, you know, the women are there in Mark's gospel, but they just run off and are scared. And we think, oh, that's the earliest one. I, what I'd say is that that's actually a, a sort of an anti-woman, uh, you know, version uh, that's responding to women being the first resurrection uh, heralds, that's which is what you get later Kelsus, in. Kelsus, John. That, that's one of Kelsus's things that he points out. He says, a woman point? You're, you want me to believe a woman? What? Right. Exactly. Right. So what makes more sense? That's, that's that women were the, originally, yeah, the, the, and then it was later, you know, masculinized to add credibility mm. or that they later added in women. Right. So this, you know, Mary is getting marginalized when you look at these texts. Yeah. Like there's a, to me, there's a straight line from, the women resurrection uh, witnesses in Marcion's gospel to like the gospel of Mary and the gospel of Philip, where yeah. Mary's place, Good Mary point. is being sidelined in favor of Peter yeah. as like the dominant male, um, you know, uh, witness of the resurrection. So yeah, there, there's a lot there. And I would just encourage people to go to, I have an open science book um, called the gospel of the poor. And it's got like 13,000 views so far. I've been writing it for the last three, three plus, you know, almost three years now. And wow. um, it it details these hypotheses, you know, hypotheses meticulously and does statistics and Greek reconstructions and a full like synoptic parallel chart. So, you know, if, if I'm right, I, I, you know, like it sounds huber like hubris, I know, but I think I, I've basically got the synoptic problem. Like I'm on the right track in terms of yeah. coming up with a scientific solution to it. That's not just conjecture or idiosyncrasy. Like I think the data just quantitatively actually backs up what I'm saying. And I think I've, I've shown that for the first time. So this is where I want like hardcore scientists to actually like scrutinize my work and tell, yeah. you know, if I'm full Are of you... crap, tell me I'm full of crap. Right. But, you know, I think statistically I'm sure, and, and this is, I think the weakness in a lot of other potential, you know, proposed solutions, a synoptic problem is they have no statistical data to back it up or what statistical data they do publish when they do, it's murky at best it doesn't clarify the picture. It just muddles the picture, right? So they're not able to show statistically significant findings. I think what I'm beginning to show, even though I'm not a professional statistician, is that these are statistically significant variations and these are statistically, these are patterns that can be validated statistically. So we'll get into that today uh, with with looking at, at, at these patterns. So I've retitled it uh, and I can, I can go to the presentation now. Um, 
Sure. Or is yeah, it, it's, it's, it's already up. It's already yeah, up. Okay. Up. I'm yeah. just going to make my screen bigger so I can okay. see it. So, yeah. So I'm calling it 100 Data Patterns <laughs> Evidencing the Priority of Marcion's Gospel. Or, and this is, you know, tongue in cheek, uh, for all you proto Orthodox parrots, many things we deemeth Marcion doth hateth. Um, and you, you'll see as we go through, like, the more data patterns we look at. Um, and I, I'm not going to, like, break out the statistics in this presentation. This is more for a mass audience, just to show, like, when you look carefully at the data of Marcion's Gospel versus Canonical Luke, you just see these patterns over and over and over again. And uh, often they're clustered, right? You, it's not just one data pattern you see, like, occurring, and then other data patterns occur in other places. Like, you see cluster after cluster after cluster, 10, 20, 30 features all clustered together in a verse or in two verses. So that's what data scientists look for. It's, you know, non-random patterns in data. Um, and then they look for clustering of those patterns. So I think I think that's that's what the data shows. So here's a reference to my book. You can, it's open access. Um, you know, eventually I might, you know, print portions of it or submit portions of it as journal articles, but I, because this was so brand new and I'm really trying to pioneer a whole new method, I didn't want to wait like three years, which is usually what it takes to get stuff published in religious studies. I just wanted to move forward, get the stuff out there, get people talking about it. And then if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Like, correct me, show me, show me where I'm wrong. But I'm right. just going to continue to, and I think it's publicly important. Like this, if if I'm on the right track, this is a significant contribution to not only the discipline of New Testament studies, but to science. Yeah. And so I just want to get this out there, and I want to get people talking about it. And uh, I don't want to do it by myself. I, I want to work on a, a team of people who can scrutinize this, who can evaluate it, tell me if I'm wrong, you know. And um, and I want to constantly improve it too. So this book, I, I basically release a new version of it about every month. So uh, if there are any like additions, corrections, you know, somebody on a, a bulletin board recently was mentioning like Gospel of Thomas traditions. You know, I, I don't fully account for all of those in, in my footnotes. And that person is absolutely right. Like I haven't gone through all the Thomas stuff and fully integrated it into the book yet. So that's something I need to do. So that to me, that's, it's kind of like software development. It's like a future improvement cycle in the, in the book as this evolves, I will add that stuff in, you know, eventually. Um, so here, here's the challenge, scientific challenge. How can we identify and validate non-random patterns within and across many diffuse data sets of the earliest Christian texts? And um, what I found looking at Marcion's gospel is, you know, we had about 10 major reconstructions throughout history, but um, every wow. editor just did his own thing. Like if you look, <laughs> you know, if you look at August Hahn, he did the first one or Theodore Zahn or Adolf von Harnack or whatever, each one was using a completely idiosyncratic method in terms of representing the data, right? You know, wow. we'll use parentheses for this or brackets for that, or, you know, like uh, triangle lines for this or italics for that or bold for this. And, and, you know, if you get to Roth's, he has, I think I counted up 19 different indications or typographical conventions to show different kinds of things. So like very, very confident, very confident, not so confident, you know, it's, and it's just gets to the point where like, this is crazy, right? There's no, this data is so, muddled it's so confusing it's so idiosyncratic that you can't actually compare it scientifically and you know i like i, I want to think the best about people but it, it you know it, to me is looking at this in terms as like you know part of my background is information science data science database management like th this data is just it's just a mess like there's no way you can build this into a scientific experiment or do scientific analysis or correlations on it so to me like the main problem in in the discipline it's not you know, like we need to look at these texts and take them seriously, but you know, we can debate until our, you know, our heads turn red, but if we don't have solid data to start, you know, it's garbage in garbage out or what, whatever you want to call it. Like if you don't have solid data to start with, you can't even begin to have a scientific, serious scientific conversation about this. So the first task that I set out to do, or one of the first tasks I set out to do after releasing my hypotheses and all this was just normalize the data. Like, let's take this mess, like super rant, you know, idiosyncratic mess of data and then distill it into consistent data where all the data, like you can make apples to apples comparisons where all the data means the same thing. So that's what I did. And, and this, these all went through peer review. So it went and went to the Journal of Open Humanities Data. It's editor in chief. I mentioned this in a previous presentation on um, Jacob's channel. It's Barbara McGilly Ray. She's at the Turing Institute at Cambridge and at King's College London. She's one of the most eminent class uh, computational linguists in the world. Wow. Um, and oversees a, a major project called the Diorosis, which is a, a huge compendium of Greek, um, you know, digital text, richly tagged, richly annotated, 
uh, Greek text that lets people do like, sophisticated analysis about linguistic patterns in Greek over time. Like how does the Greek language evolve and what does oh, it look wow. like in different places? Right? Yeah. It's basically like an, a, th a thousand year compendium of Greek literature that lets you yeah. do this really rigorous. Like what, what does Ionian Greek sound like in 542 BC? Versus what is, versus, you know, what did yeah. Attic Greek sound like, you know, a hundred years later? Right. Versus and, it, and you'd be surprised how often it changes. Languages constantly evolve. And yeah, every hundred years. It's and that's, that's yeah. why it's so important. Like if you want to date writings and you don't have external date references, one of the best things you can do is look at linguistic pattern from the broader environment. You know, if people were saying groovy a lot in the 1960s and 70s, and then you see groovy all over a text, it's pr you know, it's probably not written in the 40s or 50s, you know? Uh, it's probably written after the 60s or 70s, right? And and where is it written? Like if it's, if that word's more popular in Australia the last 10 years, like maybe this text is Australian as often as it's using the word group, right? So yeah, yeah. We we need to you know like it's that's like what legitimate. At, when you look at Daniel, you can tell it's 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 from the Hellenistic period just because all the idioms that are in there. Yes. Any any expert in the language is right right away. They're like, there's no there's no way this is written. in five or whatever 400 right. exactly yeah it doesn't fit a babylonian context or yeah. Persian context if you get into the the ideas uh, or or the register even though it's you know aramaic it's still a greek contextual aramaic uh, right it's happening there so the what i've done here it, with this journal these are all peer-reviewed data sets so you know these were scrutinized by other scholars and accepted for publication and uh, the data sets themselves are in the Harvard Dataverse. So there are 12 different data sets. So we now have actual Marcion gospel data that we can use, that scientists can use to start to analyze and correlate these data. Now, the, the what I published are really kind of starter data sets. They're not the richly tagged, like there's no syntactical tagging. I'm not looking at like, you know, um, all the relationships between words. I'm really just, it's just individual word tags of like, what's the part of speech? And then what's the form or the morphology in Greek? But, and, and then what's the lemma? What's the root word? But, but that work that I did basically like manually tagging most of this data, it's still really rich and really valuable. You can see things in the data that you would not otherwise see just by reading a Greek text and certainly not by looking at an English translation. But, but you know, computational linguists out there should know that just because something's in Greek doesn't mean you can't analyze it. Even if you don't know Greek, you can still do things like transliterate all the Greek letters into English letters and then just look at the patterns. Even if the words don't make sense to you in English, they, they can just be English letters, but you can still see the same underlying patterns, right? There, there's no problem with, with transforming data uh, you know, to do analysis. In fact, sometimes new things open up when you do that kind of thing. Um, so that, that data is out there and we can now start to do serious scientific work on Marcion's gospel as it relates to other Christian traditions. And we need to do the same thing for a bunch of other texts too, like Gospel Peter, Gospel Thomas. Why are there not standard digital, like richly tagged digital editions that are public you know, in the public domain for people to do this kind of analysis. And, and I would say it's just, it just shows the malaise of our discipline that we're not actually in our discipline interested in doing science. And so, you know, we have all these wonderful resources for the canonical texts, but usually they're distributed in like private software. Hmm. You know, there's a couple like Logos or, you know, Accordance. So these are software vendors that make a lot of money selling software to pastors that help some do an analysis of Greek texts. But they're not really interested in scientific, like pushing scientific right. boundaries or asking tough scientific questions. Yeah. They're not interested in Marcion's gospel at all. So you're not going to find data sets, Greek data sets of Marcion's gospel in those software programs. Because, you know, like those those software tools have a vested interest, I think, in in like reinforcing a dialogue that's faith based yeah. and faith centered rather than legitimate scientific inquiry. Um, so yeah, I'll just go through my hundred findings and um you know, and, and just, I just want people to keep in mind, like, what's the most likely scenario that these data patterns evidence an abridgment, right? So that's the proto-Orthodox hypothesis that Marcin came in, Marcin had canonical Luke, and then he chopped it up. He cut it down, right? Um, or is it more reasonable that Marcin was the early, has attests an earlier, simpler form of this text that was later expanded into canonical Luke, right? That's, again, all scholars agree uh, Luke and Marcion are basically, you know, different versions of the same text. It's just which one is earlier and which one's later. That's the only bone right. of contention. So right. as I go through these data patterns, just for your here, you know, audience, just, you know, ask yourself, like, what, what makes more sense just in terms of the data? Um, you know, Mark Goodacre from Duke was recently on Jacob's channel, and I, I asked him a question in the, in the live stream. 
you know, like, have you read the recent scholarship on Gospel Marcion? And his response was something along the lines of, well, I don't think the evidence supports that, you know, Marcion's gospel is earlier, something like that. And, you know, like, in some ways, this presentation is a rebuttal. Like, uh, I'm going to give Good Acre and everybody else out there. Here's a hundred Too ways. Too many EBA concerts, man. You got to get back to the books. The evidence. Yeah, exactly. Like, that was a Good Acre joke because he goes to so many EBA concerts. He loves Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. He was I love EBA too. Last like, night, yeah. he posted on Facebook at the concert. I was okay. like, man, he's always yeah. posting Ava concert yeah. videos. Yeah, while well, he's that doing was, Dancing Queen, I am compiling. Yeah, while you're fire. going to Ava concerts, we're here reading the text. So Yeah, yeah. So I would say Goodacre hasn't actually looked seriously at the evidence. And when he does, if, if he ever does, the evidence is overwhelming. It's not even close. So here again, here a hundred things. Like So if Goodacre wants to rebut this, great. Or if anybody else wants to rebut this, great. But um. You know, and, and again, look in my open science book for, for validation of this, right? And you often find like visualizations, even for this right here, Luke and single traditions. I have like nice charts and graphs showing this. And n not only showing that it's true of like one edition, like Roth's edition of Marcion's gospel, but it's true in every single edition, right? There are eight major Greek editions now, and you see the same data patterns in all eight. So like, you know, Matthias Klinghart's reconstruction of Marcion's gospel is 13,000 words. It's pretty long. Roth's is 4,000 words, so that's that's a huge gap between those. But Dune's about 7,000. That's where, close to where I'm, I'm at. It's kind of in the middle, which I think that's on the right track. But all these patterns, if you look at them, they're consistent across all editions. It doesn't matter who's reconstructing Marcin's gospel because the data clearly points you know, in these directions pretty much for all 100 of these features. So you're, you're going to see cleaner data. Like if you compare Roth's and Klinghart's, Roth's data will be much cleaner because Klinghart puts a lot of stuff that's from canonical Luke and he puts it in Marcion's gospel and that muddies the picture. It, it, it you know, makes the data ambiguous. Um, so Roth is a good starting point in terms of clean data. Uh, Harnack as well, even though they're only 4,000 words. So they're, they're 3,000 words short, but the 4,000 words is much cleaner data than what you get in Klinghart and Nicolodi. So like, which is not to say that Klinghart and Nicolodi were wrong for trying to do a complete restoration of Marcin's gospel. Like that's what we need to do. That's the goal. And we may not ever get like 100% there. We may only get like 90% there, but that's okay. Like even with the canonical text, we, we never get to 100%. Like maybe we get to like 98% of what the canonical text was looking at all the manuscripts and all the variations. Like we don't know exactly what yeah. the canonical forms of these texts were because as soon as, you know, people start copying stuff and things start translating, that you're going to have diversity within within the textual tradition. So there there is no perfect canonical form of the text. Uh, everything that we do is a reconstruction. The, the only question is how, how, you know, close can we get in terms of accuracy on our reconstructions? And if we can get to like 98% accuracy in the canonical text, I think we might be able to get to like 90% you know, give or take with the Marcionite stuff. The problem is right now, like most of the discourse is around 50%. Like, you know, Roth is, and Harnack are like 4,000 words. But if the text was actually about 7,500 words, then then Roth and Harnack are all off the bat. They're only about like getting to 55% of what the text actually was. Where Klinghart, you know, I, I liken this like shooting the moon. Like Roth, if, you know, if Roth was trying to land, uh, you know, a lunar, you know, uh, spacecraft, you know, a spacecraft on the moon, uh, he barely made it out of the atmosphere, right? He didn't, he didn't get there. Like it's well short. And he knows that, like it's, there's just a lot of stuff that's missing. And, uh, you know, there's just, just gaps where Klinghart and Nickelodeon, they overshot the moon, mm. but we can learn a lot from how they overshot the moon. Yeah. But, but, but Dune and I, we're pretty close to there. And I think Vincent is, is coming around about basically the same kind of position. So I think we're starting to see the emergence of, what I would say is a scholarly consensus that Marcin's gospel was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 7,000 to 8,000 words. That's a scientifically reasonable position. And, you know, the, the, the challenge then is like, how close can we get to that? Anyway, that's, that's kind of, that may be too much of an aside, but I hope that gives viewers some context sure. that like, uh, you know, yeah, it's a hypothetical text in some sense, but not fundamentally different uh, in terms of doing a reconstruction. And, um, it's it's not hypothetical in the sense of like we're just imagining this. Like we have over seven hundred attestations to the text by over fifteen different right. authors in antiquity. So yeah. everybody knew this text. <laughs> we have it's our first Absolutely. you know yeah. first text where you have a gospel commentary there you know and you have attestations in Armenian, in Syriac, in Arabic, yeah. Latin, Greek. Right. This was a very broadly 
uh, known and circulated text. It was suppressed, right? And then the question then becomes like, well, if it was suppressed, can we reconstruct it? Of course we can reconstruct it, right? You reconstruct it from the quotations and allusions and paraphrases as well as the vestiges that are in the manuscripts, right? So like Julian the Apostate wrote a treatise against Christians that was suppressed and destroyed, but Cyril of Alexandria and Augustine both wrote extensively against it and quoted it. So if we use their quotations, we can actually reconstruct a fair amount of what Emperor Julian wrote. Same thing with Celsus, right? We don't have Celsus's original true doctrine, but Origen wrote an right. extensive 10 book commentary on it and he quotes now, extensively now enough, right. from it so you know we you know nobody would say oh we can't know what celsus thought bull crap of course we can know what celsus thought because origins quoting Got the it. reconstruction right here exactly exactly <laughs> so this is not a fool's errand of course yeah. we can reconstruct this text just because the primary witnesses we have to it are secondary because you know they're they'd had this text in front of them and they're quoting it but just because we don't have a manuscript just of Marcion's gospel, that's right. not an excuse. And that's what all the recent scholarship from the last 10 years, looking carefully at the patristic attestations by Tertullian, Adamantius Dialogue, Epiphanius, and, and many others, but also looking at the manuscripts, because often, like the especially in Syriac and Old Latin, the manuscripts actually line up with yeah. what the Marcionite witnesses are saying against the canonical form of the text. Right. So Klinghart's found this over and over and over again. You find like traces or vestiges in the man in the canonical Luke manuscripts of the Marcionite readings. Hmm. So there's there's a huge amount of cross contamination that's happening from the earliest years in these traditions. So the, the the question is like, how do you reconstruct, and then how do you decontaminate? That's that's the challenge yeah. facing scholars right now. All right. Uh, so yeah, here here's number one. Uh, Luke and single tradition. So these are the things that only in Luke's gospel and not in Mark and Matthew. So it turns out if you look at Marcin's gospel, like most of the stuff not in Marcin's gospel at all. So what makes more sense? Did Marcin just get rid of all the stuff that was unique to Luke while using Luke? Or, you know, or get rid of most of it? Or was that stuff added in later? Uh, right. There's a non-random surplus of synoptic triple tradition. So if you find a tradition in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, vast majority of those are in Marcin's gospel. Right, when there's alignment between the three. If there's a double tradition, Luke and Matthew align, that tends to there, there, that more often than not tends to be in Marcion's gospel and at a higher rate than in the canonical text. Same thing with Q traditions. If you go through like Kloppenberg's edition of Q and you just like look verse by verse at all the Q traditions, like about 55% of those uh, are in Marcion's gospel. Hmm. So like if you take any random verse in canonical Luke, it, there's a 40% chance it shows up in Marcion's gospel, right? But if you look at Q traditions, that goes up to 55%. So the Q traditions are overrepresented significantly uh, within this text. The same thing applies to dubious Q traditions. So if you, again, look at Kloppenberg and, and others, critical edition of Q, there's you know many passages and verses and so on that they mark as doubtful. So if you just look at those, 60% of the time, those are in Marcion's gospel, again, versus like 40% of what's in canonical Luke. Um, there's a systematic lack of Mark and traditions. So there's like extended sections in Mark that are not in Marcin's gospel. And yet in other parts of Mark, there's perfect like passage by passage parallels, even more faithful than what you find between Mark and Matthew. So at some point, Marcin's gospel is more faithful than Mark than Matthew is, but in other parts, it's completely detached from Mark's gospel, right? Wow. So th this is why I think a multi-stage uh, you know, hypothesis for Mark has to, has to, is the only reasonable explanation of the data. Uh, when you find unique overlaps between Mark and Luke, uh, you know, and there are several of these, you know, the, 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 in the longer ending, you find some of these, but in, in several other places as well, like uh, the woman who gives a, the widow's might, that's only in Mark and Luke. Well, but it's not in Marcin's gospel. So like, if you count up all of these things that are unique overlaps between Mark and Luke, most of those uh, are not in Marcin's gospel. They're disproportionately Makes missing. Sense. Uh, textual sources, you know, so canonical Luke advertises it's using a lot of sources. If you look at Marcin's gospel carefully, it looks like it's only using about two sources. It doesn't look like it's pulling from a lot of different sources. Travel references. So Marcin's gospel, right? Marcin, according to his later detractors, was a ship owner, very well traveled, wealthy. Um, you know, so what, what makes more sense? Marcin took out pretty much like all the travel references, almost all the, well, not all of them, but you know, a high, high percentage of the travel references or that canonical Luke added in a, a bunch of travel references. And, you know, these are like back and forth trips, 
you know, in, in the classical literature, you have the uh, exitus reditus, right, where a hero goes off on a journey, the exitus, the leaving, and then the reditus, the return. That trope occurs again and again and again in canonical Luke, even in the story of uh, the prodigal son. He goes off on a journey, returns, right? Off on a journey, returns. Spirits do this in canonical Luke. Jesus' parents do this in canonical Luke. You, you never find that in Marcion's gospel. There's no there and back again, a hobbit's journey in Marcion's gospel, but it keeps happening again and again in canonical Luke. Uh, place names, again, so many geographical references in canonical Luke, hardly any in Marcion's gospel. What makes more sense there? Marcion hated to mention place names or that these were later imposed in the interest of creating like a, a various militudinous, you know, like a, a historic, like fictional historicized uh, account. 